call to order. Welcome everyone. Call to order for the city council meeting of 3-20-2018. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, Sylvia. Mayor Weislevel. Here. Council President Garland. Here. Councilor Kuyper. Here. Councilor Young. Here. Councilor Browse. Here. Councilor Griffin. Here. Councilor Rosner. Here. Thank you. Approval of the agenda is the next item. Mayor, I'd like to make a, a amendment to the agenda. I would like to um, move item seven below item five, so basically switching item seven presentations with citizens' comments and just um, rearranging those. I also like to make an amendment to section eight under public hearings, item B. That should read ordinance 2018-005. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, consent agenda? Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Uh, do you want to read all the items? Yeah. Do you want to read? I can read all the items. Yes, please. Approval of March 3, 2018, City Council meeting minutes. Approval of March 6, 2018, City Council meeting minutes. Approval of March 12, 2018, City Council meeting minutes. And resolution 2018 024, reporting Roxanne Suniga Blackwood to the Cultural Arts Commission. Motion to motion? approve. <laughs> Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Now we're getting on to the uh, presentations. We have introduction of a new police captain, Chief. Thank you, Mayor Council. Uh, it's great to take an opportunity and, and introduce our new captain to you. Uh, but when I say new, I mean uh, new title only. So, John, you want to, uh, Captain Carlson, you want to come up? And so we held an internal promotion process, and, and John uh, got the position. And so I'm just going to have him, again, he's not, he's not new to Sherwood or the police department. So just have him take a quick second and tell you a little bit about his career here and go from there. All right. I'm not good at talking about myself, but uh, <laughs> um, I started here in, back in 1995 as a uh, reserve. Yeah, wow. Uh, <laughs> I've been a sergeant now for 16 years. I've lived in Sherwood since 2000. <laughs> so obviously, uh, as I said, John has been has been with this community and a part of this community for quite a while. So. We're really excited to have him uh, take this next step in his career and, and uh, go forward with us. Any questions or anything? I have a question. What made you decide to become a captain? <laughs> like an interview question. <laughs> uh, thought it was the right time. I thought I had a lot to offer for uh, that next step in the promotion process. Uh, and then this is a good way to uh, end my career as a captain. Now, in the interview, it was an interview question. You said something about wanting to work with me closer. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't say that tonight. So. He was careful. Tell the truth tonight. <laughs> <laughs> right, we'll, we'll stop there. Thank you. Well, congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. You congratulations. Thank you very much. Welcome you. aboard. Our next item is a proclamation, and it's the proclamation for the Egg Hunt for Hope. <laughs> wow. You need to grow. <laughs> 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 We've never seen anything like this before. <laughs> Hooray. Uh, 
It's going to be hard reading this because I can't <laughs> stop laughing. <laughs> it's the 12th annual McCabe Real Estate Group's Benefit Egg Hunt for Hope. Saturday, March 31, 2018. <laughs> Whereas the McCabe Real Estate Group in Sherwood has coordinated an annual community egg hunt for Hope Benefit since 2007. And whereas through the efforts of Todd and Leslie McCabe, local Sherwood residents and real estate brokers with McCabe Real Estate Group and Keller Williams Realty, they started a local event that brings the community together each year to hold an Easter egg hunt that emotionally and financially supports a local family affected by cancer. And <clears throat> whereas, whereas through the support of businesses and community members, they have brought together thousands of children, adults, families through the years to participate in a nationwide tradition of an Easter egg hunt. And whereas the community has continually supported this event that helps a local family financially, <laughs> as they are facing the challenges of dealing with cancer in their lives. Now, therefore, I, Lee Wise Logo, on behalf of the City of Sherwood, do hereby proclaim the City an Egg Hunt for Hope community and urge our citizens to participate in this event to be held at Sherwood High School on Saturday, March 31, 2018, at 12 p.m. Further, I declare March 31, 2018, as Egg Hunt for Hope Day in the city of Sherwood. Thank you all. Mayor, can I make a comment on that? You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Bunny. So this year, our recipient is uh, Barb Johansson, and she's been a longtime supporter of Egg Hunt for Hope on the committee, and it was just timing this year that we are able to bless her um, and support her through this <coughs> wonderful event. So come on out on the 31st and support our event. Thank you. Any other comments from council? Just thank you to the McCabe's for your generosity. <clears throat> you bet. Yes, thank you. Our next item is item C, Proclamation Arbor Week, April 1 to 7, 2018. <clears throat> this is the proclamation for Arbor Week, April 1 to 7, 2018. Whereas in 1872, the first Arbor Day was observed in Nebraska with the planting of more than a million trees. And whereas Arbor Day is now observed throughout the nation and the world, and whereas the state of Oregon has decreed that the first full week of April shall be designated as Arbor Week, and whereas the city of Sherwood has been a tree city since 2005, this being its 13th year as a tree city, and whereas the city is committed to urban forestry as a partner in Clean Water Services Tree for All campaign, a collaborative effort to plant native trees and shrubs in the Tualatin River Basin. And whereas trees properly planted and cared for are a source of community environment that assists in mental and peaceful renewal and provides many comforts such as shade, clean air, beauty, and increasing property values. And whereas having beautiful trees planted in our community is important to our citizens. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Lee Weislogel, Mayor of the City of Sherwood, do hereby proclaim April 1 to 7, 2018, as Arbor Week 2018 in the City of Sherwood. I call upon the citizens of Sherwood and the surrounding community to celebrate Arbor Week, to support efforts to protect our trees and woodlands, and to plant trees that promote the well-being of this and future generations. Thank you all. Our 
Our next item is Student Art Show Award recipients. Maggie? First, I would actually like to introduce uh, Mike and Darla Boljat to say a few words. They were the curators of this show. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, be recognized or for this event to be recognized again for the third year. Um, my name is Mike Boljat, and this is my wife, Darla Boljat, and uh, the student, uh, Sherwood Student Art Show. Uh, the Student Sherwood Art Show is, a, is an art event as well as an art show. It's a collaboration between the local Makers 5 Artist uh, Collective and the Sherwood Center for the Arts. Um, we are the point people who spearhead this project from vision to reality, but we couldn't do it alone, so uh, we send out a... Uh, very sincere thank you to Maggie Chapin and her team at the Sherwood Arts Center um, for seeing the vision that was originally cast three years ago and for their generosity in hosting the event each spring. The last thank you is for the City of Sherwood, Mayor and City Council as well, and staff for understanding the value of this endeavor by taking time away from city business to recognize the Student Award winners and their visual art. 2018 marks the third annual presentation of the show. The aim of the show is simple, celebrating the creativity and artistic creations of student artists who are instructed in the visual arts within the city of Sherwood. Every public and private school in the city of Sherwood, as well as independent art studios, are invited to submit art from their students. Students' ages range from six through adult. The art show consists of visual art, including paintings and drawings, and they are currently on the walls at the, uh, at the Art Center for display. Each painting is placed on display at the center in the spring for a period of approximately one month. This year, the show will run through April 19th. Um, each painting is uh, juried uh, with only the name of the artist and they're juried by age group uh, by local professional artists who have no affiliation with any of the artists or the schools in, in the city of Sherwood. Uh, ribbons are awarded by age group uh, by the jurors for students in each category. Um, but really, um, on top of the ribbons, the most valuable experience is for these students to attend an art show, be a part of a reception, where they're able to celebrate in the community with family and friends um, their, their success in art. So we thank you again. It's the name of the, name of the painting. Yes. Not, not the name of the artist, right. just the name of the painting. Okay. Oh, sure. So they don't have any idea who did it. It's a blind yeah, jury. That's nice. oh, oh, that's awesome. It's really just. Yeah, so just yeah. the name. Yeah. Any questions before we turn this back over to Maggie? No. no. Thank you again. This, this thank you. So um, thank you so much, Council and Mayor, for letting us be here. Um, got this logged up. We have, uh, as usual, a great little slideshow so that we can show you some of the winning pieces and call the kids up here, or and adults, the winners up here as well. So I think Mayor has some certificates, correct? So I'm going to call the name of the artist, and if they would please come forward and get your certificate from the mayor. All right, so the first category was first through fifth grade. The first piece is by McKenna Thompson. And McKenna, come on up. Um, and McKenna did it this piece in watercolor, and she's a student of Sherwood Charter School. Congratulations, McKenna. <laughs> Second place in this category was Trevor Chai. Chi, so sorry. Come on up, Trevor, if you're here. <laughs> All right, and Trevor did this piece, Oil on Canvas, titled Soaring Sky, and he's a student of Mosaic Arts Lofts. And third place in this category was Kaylin Perlmutter. So come on up if you're here, Kaylin. <laughs> Kaylin did this piece in acrylic called Midwinter Snow, and she is a student at the Sherwood Center for the Arts. And honorable mention in this category was Becca Flossie. Come on up, Becca. 
she did this piece in acrylic called Winter Barn, and she's a student of the Sherwood Center for the Arts. All right, the next category was sixth through eighth grade. And the first piece was by Jonathan LaRue. Jonathan here. He did this piece in graphite, and he was a student of the Sherwood Charter School. We'll make sure Jonathan gets his certificate. Second place was by Rachel Farner. Rachel? Rachel did this awesome piece in graphite that is untitled, but I think I'm going to call it Cool Owl. <laughs> Third place, uh, Kiki Dobson. She's not here. Okay, but she did this awesome piece, and you have to see this one in person. It's awesome. Acrylic um, called Under the Surface, and she's a student of Sherwood Center. For the <laughs> All right, and honorable mention in this category, Ry uh, Rylan Blanchard. Is Rylan here? Yeah, yeah come on up, Rylan. <laughs> and Rylan did this piece in acrylic called Snowy Red, and she's a student of Sherwood Center for the Arts. All right, next category, ninth through 12th grade. First place, this one also you need to see in person, by Natalie Orlick. Come on up, Natalie, if you're here. Come on here. This piece was also done in acrylic called Midnight Glow. Second place, Maddie Kramer. Kramer. Sorry, Maddie. She's not here. Oil on canvas called Lion's Sunset. This is cool. Third place from uh, Morgan Van Bergen. Is Morgan here? Yay! This one has captured the imagination of a lot of people that come into the center. I get to watch them enjoy it. It's oil on canvas in several, it's like it's in different pieces. It's really cool. It's called The World is Our Pond. So good job, Morgan. All right, next category, adults, so 18 plus. And first place is by Kiki Gavin. And this piece was done in acrylic. It's called Tranquility. Second place is by Liliana Moga. This piece was done in acrylic called Winter. And honorable, oh, oh, sorry, third place, Joe Murphy. No problem. This was in acrylics called Cottages in the Mist. I know. It's great. And honorable mention in this category was Tammy Widensmith. Is Tammy here? No. Nope. This was Oil on Canvas called Apples. Thank you. So thank you again for the certificates, Mayor Weislogel, and thank you everybody. And thank you to all of the student artists and the teachers who do so much for these kids. And we're just thrilled that art is taught in our community. And it's just an absolute privilege to get to show some of this stuff. So keep doing art, kids and adults. <laughs> And there's a lot more. Yes. Isn't there a few more yes. out there? And there just... are more than just the ones who won. Yeah. Written. And they're so much fun to look at. And what I love most is that it is a juried show. And these students get a chance to be juried by working artists. And that's such, such a boon for the students to be able to have that. So thank just you. Just the experience of having your pieces on yeah, the wall. Yeah, on display. Too, really and yeah, so <laughs> well, I was, was going to say, even outside of this art show here, it's just everybody should go into the art center for the arts every once in a while and just check out what's on the walls. I mean, there's here, photography, here. So there's paintings. There's, it, it's amazing. This what artwork is still going to be on the walls during the April 19th Art Walk. Nice. So oh. come nice. on by. That's a great chance to see it. The next show at the Center for the Arts is going to be featuring our instructors in town. So we have the students. Now we want to highlight the great instructors. The show is called Those Who Teach. Yeah. We thank you and we thank the staff. We love our Sherwood Center for the Arts. <laughs> and we love you. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next item, uh, citizen comments. Sylvia, do you have? Mayor, I have no sheets submitted this evening. OK. Moving on to uh, 
Our next item. Our next category is uh, item eight, public hearings. Uh, the first one, item A, ordinance 2018-003, adopting minor amendments to the city of Sherwood's 2014 transportation system plan, volume one and two, and to, and to the zoning and community development code, chapter 16.106 transportation facilities. Sylvia? Mayor and Council, um, this evening we have a public hearing statement for both items on the agenda. Um, I'll kind of insert a language because each item, one item is a first hearing, the second item is, a, is a, a second hearing. So the Sherwood City Council will hold public hearings this evening to hear testimony on Ordinance 2018-003, adopting minor amendments to the Sher City of Sherwood's 2014 Transportation System Plan, Volume 1 and 2, and to the Zoning and Community Development Code, Chapter 16.106, Transportation Facilities. This is the second reading on this ordinance. The, um, the uh, process the Council will uh, follow tonight in conducting this hearing is to hear a staff report, questions if any by the City Council for staff, receive written testimony. We will then open the public hearing for testimony and the time will be limited to four minutes per person. Any interested person may present testimony. We will then close the public hearing. No other comments will be heard from the public. Final comments from staff, questions of staff, if any, by the council. Discussion uh, will follow by the council. For ordinance 2018-005, adopting the housing needs analysis for the 2018 to 2038 planning period and a text amendment to the Sherwood Comprehensive Plan, part two Sherwood Development Plan. This is the first hearing on this item. The council will follow the same procedures as previously stated. For this first hearing, the city council um, will generally hold two hearings prior to making a decision. A second hearing on this item is currently scheduled for um, April 17th. That was per the discussion in the work session earlier this evening. Um, however, in accordance with the Sherwood City Charter, council reserves the right to make a decision at the close of this hearing by unanimous vote of all sitting council members. If you wish to speak, please fill out the testimony form and submit it to the city recorder. The mayor will recognize those persons wishing to speak. Any questions should be addressed through the mayor. When you come forward, please state your name and address for the record as this hearing will be recorded. Please limit your testimony to four minutes. In reaching a decision on this item, the council may be required to consider whether the matter meets relevant approval criteria or any other applicable law. If applicable, those criteria are identified in the staff report and testimony and evidence must address these criteria or other criteria you believe to apply to the decision. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Let's proceed with uh, item A, the 2018-003. And Erica, please. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, staff gave a full presentation of the proposed changes at the last Council meeting on March 6th. So tonight, I hope to be really brief and to just giving you a summary of the proposed changes. So in summary, the proposed updates make three figures in the TSP consistent with one another, showing Brookman as an arterial road the entire length. Um, the improvements to Brookman Road in the project table will be renamed to Brookman Road Improvements. And then we have added a new figure map, figure uh, 17B, which will show streets for right of way is planned for more than two lanes within Sherwood. And then finally, we have a change to the Sherwood Zoning and Community Development Code, Chapter 16.106, Transportation Facilities. And we're just making a small um, figure text change to a figure number so it references the right map within the TSP document itself. So with that, um, staff, our recommendation um, for tonight is to approve ordinance 2018-003. Uh, Council questions? Okay, not hearing any. Uh, the public hearing is now uh, open on this item. Sylvia, have we? Mayor and Council have no sheets submitted. Okay, with no uh, public comment, I'll close the uh, public hearing. Discussion, uh, Council? 
one for me. No. Can we have a motion? I move that we caption and adopt, adopt ordinance 2018-003, adopting minor amendments to the city's City of Sherwood's 2014 Transportation System Plan, Volume 1 and 2, and to the Zoning and Community Development Code, Chapter 16.106, Transportation Facilities. Second. second. It has been moved and seconded. Sylvia. Ordinance 2018-003, adopting minor amendments to the City of Sherwood's 2014 Transportation System Plan, Volume 1 and 2, and to the Zoning and Community Development Code, Chapter 16.106, Transportation Facilities. Councilor Rosner? Aye. Councilor Griffin? Aye. Councilor Browse? Aye. Councilor Young? Aye. Councilor Kuyper? Aye. Councilor President Garland? Aye. Mayor Weislogel? Aye. Thank you. It's unanimous. Thank you. It is approved. Uh, item B is Ordinance 2018-005, adopting the housing needs analysis for the 2018 to 2038 planning period and a text amendment to the Sherwood Comprehensive Plan, Part 2, Sherwood Development Plan. Sylvia? Mayor, the statement I read addressed both items, so at this point you would just have the staff report. Okay. Carrie, please. Hi, good, have, good evening, Mayor and City Councilors. Carrie Branicki, Senior Planner, Community Development. Uh, tonight you have before you the first reading of Ordinance 2018-005. Um, this basically is adopting the housing needs analysis for the 2000 18 to 2038 planning period, and it amends the comprehensive plan text to include the housing needs analysis as an exhibit. So I'm gonna go over some basics of housing needs analysis as I'm not sure where everybody is. So why do we need, what is it, where are we starting from? Oh, sorry. So a housing needs analysis is for statewide planning goal 10 that requires incorporated cities to complete an inventory of our buildable land and to encourage the availability of adequate numbers of housing units and price ranges and rent ranges to commensurate with the financial cap capabilities of its households. So what it does, it explains, describes the current housing market and historical and recent housing trends, describes the current and future demographic characteristics of Sherwood, it forecasts future housing needs based on these considerations and the Metro 2016 urban growth forecast. And it provides a buildable lands inventory and addresses residential land sufficiency inside our urban growth boundary to meet Sherwood's housing needs for the next 20 year planning horizon. So why do we need one? Um, H&As are developed to comply with statewide planning policies that govern planning for housing and residential development. That is goal 10. It also, we have an implementing ordinance, the Metropolitan Housing Rule, and the Metro's 2040 Functional Growth Management Plan. So if you take all our obligations together, we need to provide enough land to accommodate the forecast of housing for the 20-year planning period. Um, we need to designate land that provides the opportunity for a 50-50 split between multifamily and single family. And we need to achieve an average density of six dwelling units per acre. So this h &A was initially developed as part of the Sherwood West Preliminary Concept Plan in 2015. Um, it was for a different time period, 2015 to 2035. It informed the Sherwood, Sherwood West Preliminary Concept Plan, it, but it was never adopted or accepted by the City Council. So the big question is, why are we adopting it now as we're doing a comprehensive plan update? And basically, it is a requirement for our submittal for Metro's 2018 Urban Growth Management Decision. They informed us in August or September that this would be required. Um, we have to have an adopted and acknowledged h &A within the past five years in order to submit a proposal. Um, when I state out this proposed amendment, the comprehensive plan for the h &A contains no updates to our comprehensive plan policies our comprehensive plan goals. It doesn't update the comprehensive plan map, the zoning map, or the development code. 
Um, the H&A is for background and data purposes only and prepares for the revision and update of the housing element to the comprehensive plan, which is scheduled over the next two years. So I'll get into kind of what the conclusions of the H&A were briefly. Um, basically, Sherwood's population grew relatively fast, 8% annual growth rate between 1990 and 2013. It concludes our population is aging. The people over 45 are our fastest growing group. Um, Sherwood is attractive to younger people and households with children. 47% of our households have children and millennials will soon be our fastest growing group over the next 20 years. Sherwood's population is also slowly growing more ethnically diverse. So if these trends continue, it will result in changes in types of housing needed in Sherwood. Basically, with the aging population, aging population it is likely to increase the demand for smaller single-family housing, multifamily housing, and housing for seniors. And the growth of younger, diversified households is likely to result in an increased demand for a wider variety of affordable housing appropriate for families with children on moderate incomes, which includes family houses, townhouses, smaller single-family houses, duplexes, that sort of thing. Um, other factors that could come in, changes in commute patterns could affect the future growth of Sherwood. And also Sherwood has a relatively high income, which affects the type of housing that's affordable. So how much housing growth is forecasted and how can that growth be accommodated? So Sherwood is forecasted to add six, 1,653 new households between 2018 and 2038, according to the Metro forecast. Of these, 697 are inside city limits and 956 are in the Brookman area. Sherwood's planning area, which is the city limits and the Brooklyn area, can accommodate about 70% of the growth. So Sherwood, it also shows Sherwood has a deficit of land for housing. The deficit of land is 497 dwelling units and the largest deficits are in the medium low, medium density, high and high density residential zones. To provide the land supply, Sherwood will also need to continue in annexing in the Brookman area. For those of you who like numbers, these are the numbers that pretty much shows what I just stated, but sometimes it's good to see the graphic. So the other question is, what if Sherwood grows faster? Metro's forecast of the growth is considerably lower than our historical growth. Metro forecast is less than 1% a year. Sherwood grew by 3.4% per year between 2000 and 2013 and 8% per year average between 1990 and 2013. At the faster growth rate, Sherwood's land-based capacity um, has about four to 10 years worth of growth. Additional housing in Sherwood also depends on land being available, development ready, and that kind of points to the Brookman area. So taking a step back, we have all this data. What are we going to do with it? So the implications is, what about our UGB? Basically, it's saying Sherwood will need to add urbanizable land, such as Sherwood West, or increase densities inside the urban growth boundary to accommodate future growth beyond the existing limits in the Brookman area. Sherwood is not meeting its goal 10 obligation right now, having a 10-year supply of land for housing. 20 years, sorry. 20 year supply of land for housing. Um, what are the implications as we move forward in the comprehensive plan update um, to consider? Um, Sherwood has a limited supply of land for moderate, higher density, multifamily housing. Um, the limited number in these zones is a barrier to development of townhomes, multifamily housing, which is needed to meet the demand for the result of people growing over 65, young families, and moderate income households. Sherwood will have an ongoing need for providing affordable housing to lower income households, which will need also need a lower cost and a wider variety of types of residences, such as duplexes and multifamily residences. Sherwood currently has a limited supply of land in its planning area for moderate and high density housing. So in our code, we have criteria for comprehensive plan updates. And basically if you do a text amendment, Here's the criteria. Um, it shall be based upon the need of the amendment identified by council. 
or the commission, which your case is council, and it should be consistent with the attempt of the intent of the comprehensive plan, um, the transportation plan, the code, state law, and other statutes. So we're kind of bringing it forward to you now because we haven't had a buildable land that's been inventory in H&A since 1990. Um, we need to have a housing needs analysis in order to submit the application to Metro for the urban growth boundary expansion. And overall, our H&A is consistent with the requirable state statutes, specifically goal 10 and the Metropolitan Housing Rule. So we can make findings saying right now, our code and where our comprehensive plan is currently written, we are meeting intent of goal 10. Um, we received three comments. Um, hopefully you've gotten copies of all these. Um, one was just a written comment in support of the H&A. Um, Metro submitted a letter to us prior to tonight's meeting. I believe those at 427 this afternoon. And it's available for your review. And the Department of Land Conservation and Development submitted a letter prior to tonight's meeting. And that's available for your review. So I'll go on to what the Planning Commission they thoroughly reviewed this and held a public hearing, as is the process with comprehensive plan text amendments. So on February 13th, the Planning Commission held a public hearing for the adoption of the H&A and the comprehensive plan text amendment. Um, the Planning Commission had shared with us various concerns they had regarding the information in the H&A and the implica implications of adopting the H&A as it was presented to them. Um, they asked for additional information from staff and our consultants regarding the h &A. So they continued the hearing to February 27th and they received additional information staff provided them. They deliberated and recommended approval of the h &A and the comprehensive plan text amendment with revisions. And those were in your city council staff report. I attached a red line version of the h &A and I attached a supplemental report <coughs> they wish to provide you. So trying to summarize it on a slide, the changes they made, which I hopefully I got this right. Um, the recommend changes do not alter the data presented in the document. The data in the tables is remaining the same. If anything, it could impact the transparency of the document if someone just jumps to the executive summary and the conclusions. Um, the revisions remove conclusion summary information about the limited, land supply, limited supply of land for housing in the medium density and high density residential zones. The revisions remove implications for the H&A for Sherwood's housing policies and removes the recommendations by the consultants for updating our code to deal with growth and other things. And it removes conclusion summary information regarding Sherwood's need to provide affordable housing at a variety of housing types. So this is where it gets a little tricky. A um, bunch of information came into us today. So staff is recommending you adopt the housing needs analysis, the original version without the Planning Commission's recommendation. We're hesitant to do this, but given the comments we were provided by Metro and DLCD and the goal of submitting the proposed ask for the urban growth, expound, urban growth boundary expansion to Metro. Um, we're having concerns if the DLC will acknowledge it with the Planning Commission recommendations. And it also Metro has said it might affect our position with the urban growth boundary expansion or application if we include the Planning Commission recommendations. Um, so if the City Council makes the decision to adopt the H original h &A, they will need to state so in their motion. But since we're carrying this to the 17th, you could also provide us direction about which housing needs analysis, the original or the Planning Commission recommended one, you would like to see in the ordinance on the 17th. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Questions, Council? So I guess, Carrie, just to outline what we've seen here and what was referenced, uh, which you spoke about with the uh, DLCD and Metro, both sent letters of recommendation today to approve it without any of the 
uh, deletions that the Planning Commission had, essentially. Correct. It also, in light of that, changes the staff recommendation in your staff report. So, so prior to getting those letters, your, was your recommendation just to approve it as the Planning Commission pushed it forward? They're, they're the advising body, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and just to add, as Carrie said, generally we, we always would recommend what the Planning Commission recommendation was unless there is something that comes to light that causes us concern about that recommendation and essentially, um, and, and when we even told the Planning Commission when we had the hearing, if there's something that is against, you know, in, inconsistent with state law, then we would advise you of that and it just came very late in the process that the state and um, Metro provided comments with concerns about the Planning Commission's recommendation to to delete the, um, the conclusions. I have a question. Please. So in the, the background, it, st it states that the housing needs analysis for 2015-2035 was not adopted by the city or processed as an amendment to the city's comprehensive plan. Is, it, is there any rationale why that was the case then? Um, it wasn't needed, it just informed the Sherwood West process. Um, the city wasn't moving forward with the comprehensive plan update that and wasn't going to address housing policies at that time. And that would be the reason to adopt a housing needs analysis. So then why did we go through the process? We went through the process to inform the Sherwood West preliminary concept gotcha. plan. When we started out, we wanted to know what is it that we're trying to accomplish in the long run. And so it helped inform that. Um, but then we, we knew that we would ultimately be doing a comprehensive plan update and so we didn't adopt that because we, we didn't know exactly when. In this particular case, we, we obviously have a program to do a comprehensive plan update. We have funding to do the housing policy element of the comprehensive plan update. So the timing is a, is a little bit off, but it's not two years off. And so it actually um, you know, can fit well within that, that process. We just got a little head start on this component of the technical background of that housing needs analysis. If so, if if we took the UGB ask out of the equation here, do you typically do the housing need analysis before you do a comprehensive update, or you do it after? It would be done before Chick the comprehensive plan update. It wouldn't be adopted separately from the comprehensive plan update. It would be adopted as an element of the comprehensive plan update. It usually is included as an appendix or adopted by reference into a comprehensive plan. Because the our, our current zoning and everything, I'm sure, impacts the housing need analysis? Yes. So if you change it in a comprehensive plan update, that can change the housing need anal analysis. Am I reading that wrong? Well, it it's kind of like it a chicken and egg. It. It's, it's yeah. there to inform the comprehensive plan update process. So you attach it to the back and mm -hmm. it's in light of this information, these are the housing policies that are being moved forward. Gotcha. So essentially it's the foundation um, and, and with our with the grant that we received from the state, we got funding to do the policy component of the housing needs analysis and this technical background piece and the policy piece of the economic opportunities analysis. So essentially we just did the technical piece, foundation piece a little bit earlier than we would normally do, but it's still part of that comprehensive plan process. It's just done a little bit earlier. And one of the things that we, talked about with the Planning Commission, and I think it's important to note, is just because you adopt this doesn't mean it's done. Um, as you go into the policy component of the housing needs analysis and the economic opportunities analysis and are trying to ensure balance within our comprehensive plan, we can, you know, we can look backwards as well as look forward. So, so that this isn't the only opportunity to, to talk about things, but this is sort of the, the foundational piece. And is there a reason why we didn't do another analysis instead of just using the data from 2015? We did. We updated the analysis. Updated. Okay. That's right. This yeah. is 2018 to 2038. Gotcha. Okay. So there was additional yeah, the, work the, done. The conclusions actually changed okay. quite a bit. Yeah. Gotcha. And we Thank used you. a new metro forecast housing rate because we based this off their 2016 forecast. The previous one was based off their 2014 maybe. Okay. So in, in 2014, they had us growing at a slower rate. I would have to I'm, go I'm back just, at that document. I'm trying to understand yeah, the differences, given that. 7? The 0.7. Yeah. We just had we had land to build is the main difference between 2015. 
Yeah, because more additional building permit. Yeah. Yeah. So I had a um, just kind of a, I guess a, s a statement regarding the recommendations that Planning Commission suggested, and I think some of them might have some merit. I think as I'm reading through this, some of them, some of the redlined, I think is backed up by the data. So I don't really have a problem with some of them, but I think some of the comments are, are just subjective. An opinion of the person who did, the company who did that housing needs analysis. So I think some of the subjective stuff probably isn't necessary. Um, it's their commentary, you know. It is clear, however, that Sherwood will need a wider variety of housing, especially housing affordable to that to me is an opinion. Another area it says the growth of younger and diversified household, households will result in increased demand for wider variety of housing appropriate for family. I mean, that's an opinion. It, it's not data and it's not facts, which I appreciate the data that they've given us. I just don't know why we needed the extra commentary on some of that. Um, well, well I, was, I, I was bouncing all over. You know, I read that same information and I thought, well, maybe what they did was they said, well, here's, here's what we project the growth in a population sector will be in the city of Sherwood. And traditionally, across the nation, this is what ha it has spurred in terms of housing needs. So I agreed. I, I didn't necessarily find data in the report that supported those comments, which I think were subjective. It would be nice if they had a little sub-note that said, we're basing this on an, a national sort of, you know, assessment of population and, and what they typically need in terms of housing. But I don't see that, so it does seem it does seem subjective, so I agree with Councilor Young. Okay, my other question though is, what's the what's the risk if we leave it in? Does that does that does that does that affect what we end up doing? I mean, if we leave it in, is it does it is it actually going to change what we have to do? Are we, I'm trying to, are we jump, are we, are we doing, do we do what we need to do to jump through the Metro hoop to get an acknowledged so we can move forward? Because if it's not acknowledged, can we not move forward with yeah, the good. comprehensive plan? So that's why if we leave that stuff in there, does it, is it making a substantial effect on the direction that we take? It's, it's all just information that is going to inform the city when it does updates its housing policies for the housing policies for the comprehensive plan. It's information for Metro as they go through this urban growth boundary expansion. They want to know what our deficits are over the next 20 years. So it's, it's not a binding policy document. It's information that informs the housing discussion of the housing policies. It goes in, it's attached by reference to the comprehensive plan out in the future, but it's not, it's not a policy document. I mean, I thought of it as like saying, hey, Sherwood, you don't have enough light industrial in your community. You need to set more land aside and get that. Uh, yeah, we know, but we can't necessarily change that at the moment. You know, our reality is what it currently is. I just thought maybe, as Councilor Young s s said, there was some, a, it seemed like a side comment. Well, right. I can certainly see it from both sides. So I don't know that it would necessarily color my decision as a council member on what we ultimately do, you know, or what the comprehensive plan, you know, the CAC does. Right. Essentially, you hired a, the city hired a consultant. The consultant shared data and opinions, recommendations based on that data. It's your decision what you do with those recommendations yeah. and with that data. But by approving this, are we saying we agree with their recommendations? I guess is kind of maybe what I thought maybe planning commissions was I bit. think that was the concern, um, and and we we tried to assure them that that was not the case, but they continue to have that concern, which is why they had the Planning Commission supplemental staff report that's in your packet that sort of outlined, here's what our concerns are. Um, and I think that's valid and, and, and valuable information, but it, at the end of the day, it doesn't, I think what they're concerned is that this will be taken as, okay, this is what we said, so this is what we have to do. Right. Um, the reality is that's not yeah. the way, you know, we are, you know, I guess if if we acknowledge that that is open for discussion as we move on to the next phase, we're acknowledging that it's open for discussion as we move on to the next phase in terms of how we address it, how we conclude those things, and I, and I think that's essentially what that policy component is. But are, are the 
um, cause I kind of understand where the planning commission's at with this. And I think your concern with the letters that we got from Metro and, and the state on this is it will dim our chances of approval on an ask if we don't make, if we don't uh, adopt the original form. Um, but I, I guess for me, it creates a fundamental question. Are we designing this to increase our odds of having a successful ask or are we designing this to represent what we think is important to our community? And as an example, you know, when they talk about um, aging community, right? You know, if you look at some of the stats going back in time, when we've made more supply available, we've actually seen our average age go down because mm -hmm. we see more families move in, we see more, you know, that type of activity. When we, we're constrained, we see our aging go up. So I'm, I'm just trying to understand when they make those assumptions, how are they informing their recommendations? So I'm gonna start and, and actually then I'm gonna ask Joe to yeah. chime in on a conversation he had earlier today. Um, the consultant is not, is, is only doing her professional job. Sure. It's not, it was never a, oh, we're gonna try to, to do this. It's based on her doing a lot of housing needs analysis around the state, complying with state law, and not even just the state, the region. Mm -hmm. So it's not designed for anything. The conclusions are based on her professional judgment. Um, the concern about taking certain conclusions out sends a message um, as far as our commitment to being open to, to different, <laughs> Um, you know, affordability, and that's where, Joe, do you want to talk about inclusiveness? Well, if I might add some of my perspective, too, as just as a project manager, I write a lot of reports just like this, and um, I've actually read a couple of other Eco Northwest reports on housing needs analysis for other cities, and they just sort of lay it out there. It's an opinion. Um, but as a decision maker, if I were to try to look at the document and make decisions, I'm going to look at the executive summary, um, and the executive summary, you know, is always meant to not be a complete review of the report, but it is supposed to reflect what's in the report for purposes of decision making, even though you should be reviewing the entire document. Um, the other, so I, I'm just going to throw that out there because I do see where things that are written that have been str stricken out are also reflected in the uh, strikeouts in the executive summary. Um, one of the things that might have caused some heartburn is when the consultant is making blanket statements without saying, based on our research or in our, it is our opinion that, and sometimes adding those qualifiers can help ease sort of the concern that people have that making these sort of statements that are more, um, uh, what's the word, uh, more fi with some finality to them. Um, you know, the call out boxes, yeah, I get that. You know, calling out the bot, that's just sort of sidebars where there's a bunch of call outs that sort of bring attention to things. And I can understand why those would be stricken out. That's not a problem. But some of the more meaty data about medium des density residential um, and talking very, getting into very, mu very much specific information, um, that's all well and good. But where's the, where's that data coming from? Like, how are they, how are they building that up? And so if something can be added in those strikeouts to say, okay, based on um, uh, the medium density residential high, for instance, um, can we do some qualifying there? Would that help? Is, is that our job? Didn't we already no, hire somebody to do that? No, I don't. I mean, I'm just trying to come up with a middle path. My personal feeling is Eco Northwest does an excellent job. Um, I've seen their work before, and this is pretty standard. So, you know. Yeah, you know, and see, that's great information right there. I mean, this is pretty standard that yeah. maybe we're overreacting, and it's more of a. I mean, it's kind of like the doctor saying, "Guess what? You're not in perfect health." Right. I mean, we don't freak out over that. We're like, okay, what do we need to do then? And we make decisions based on that. And sometimes we make good decisions. Sometimes we don't make good decisions. I want to go back to the question I had. So, jumping through the hoop, I meant. If this isn't recognized, I was speaking about, not speaking about the ask at all, I was speaking about the comprehensive plan. Yeah. I was saying if this doesn't get acknowledged, does that affect the comprehensive plan process? I don't care about the ask at the moment. Well, we can change it for the comprehensive plan But it, it's not a necessary requirement. It is a requirement. It's oh. part of the comprehensive plan process. So, so we if our, do it now. Or we do it later. So if we don't, if we, if it's not, if it's not officially recognized, what state does that put our comprehensive plan in? 
we can't project our housing so we without a housing needs analysis right it's, it's not ignored I mean we the basis of our comprehensive plan one of the basis is, is the housing needs analysis as well as the economic opportunities analysis that's your foundation of kind of what it is that you expect so this is this future. is a vital piece of moving forward it is. in our comprehensive plan it does plan. not have to the UGB aside it does not have to happen right now okay. in, but it would be part of the conference plan process yeah that's what the I was timing actually for the right referring now to now is because of the UGB process. right okay one more item though is you know in the text if the text and the information in the document hasn't changed then in keeping with this council's um, personal goal for clarity and transparency it would seem that an opinion um, and recommendations and they they lay them out here as may inform these a lot of may or should um, should stay in if we're talking about complete transparency kind of following up on what Councilor Kuyper saying though too the data that and, and the opinions that are reflected in this report are consistent with Washington County and our region so while they're not necessarily stating that in their opinion is it is very consistent with what's going on. Well, and it kind of makes sense an outside, maybe an outside person coming into the community and saying, uh, you guys need a whole bunch of this kind of housing where maybe we don't necessarily think we do, right. but someone outside is telling us that we do. So uh, I feel like if it's fairly standard, maybe we're just. I've seen it in a few other Eco Northwest, Northwest reports and it's not. That's the, I have read another one of those too, but I couldn't find a different one to go read on the web between. So, sorry, so procedurally, I just want, we just had an hour and 45 minute work session. Right. So I, I get that we're in work, you know, kind of work session mode, um, but we are in a public hearing. Oh. And, okay. um, no, and, and yeah. we want to make sure that we're asking questions of staff before right. you open the public hearing. Hi, staff. And, and then this is we staff's turn. Okay. Sorry, and staff. then we'll have our discussion. <laughs> so we were kind of on a roll there, sorry. So uh, I'll, I'll get us back on track with the question. Uh, so I was reading through the Metro functional plan and, and I might quote this wrong, but there's a section there in, in there that talks about um, targets for the different cities for low income housing. And, and it's, it's, I can't remember the terminology, but it's more aspirational targets and Sherwood's was really low. It was only a 127 units. And did, does that play into this analysis? Did we look at that or? No, the, so the data that goes into it, they take the Sherwood spread of incomes basically now, and then they project it into the future. Um, that's why Sherwood's is lower. It's because we are a higher income community. So it's not, pre, they're not anticipating a flood of lower income homes, but they are saying we got 20%, we're gonna need 20%. That sort of thing. Does answers your question? No, that, that answers. Yeah, absolutely. And what's the median income that they're using in their metroscope when you did your analysis? Is it the median income for Sherwood or the median income for the Greater Portland Metro area? For this analysis, it's the median income of Sherwood. Okay. It puts okay, it into you. buckets right. about average. Mm -hmm. The way it's the analysis is is a little confusing, but the it is the Sherwood median income. All right, thank you. Yeah, gave comparisons to Portland and Washington County. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Thank yeah. you. So I was just going to go back because you were going to ask Joe to explain some conversation to us. Oh yeah. Right. Good point. Back to Joe. <laughs> so I got a call today from Martha Bennett, the Chief Operating Officer of Metro, and just for clarity, uh, the CEO of Metro, her position is very similar to mine. She's the equivalent of the City Manager for Metro. She works for the Metro Council. Um, she had a lot of questions because it came to light that the Planning Commission recommendation had st struck out a number of things. And she wanted to kind of understand what's going on. And we had a conversation about um, the UGB ask, changes on council, things like that. But her bottom line to me, her message is, if the council ultimately re approves the Planning Commission recommendation and you subsequently ask for your UGB expansion in May, you won't get it. She already because, went and took the votes of the council? No, because yeah. it's it's in, it, it basically, and you have to remember Metro is, <laughs> their number one issue in the region from their lens is affordable housing. And what she said bluntly is if this is the policy choice of Sherwood, you're basically saying you don't have an affordable housing problem in Sherwood, so you don't need more land. 
So don't waste your time putting together something if that's the direction. That wasn't necessarily a threat. I think that was a peer saying, look, we're really concerned about some of the language that's been struck out. Because from their lens as we have an affordable housing issue in this region and Sherwood is part of the region. So. So does that give us some insight into their evaluation criteria? Yes, and, it, and actually she said that affordable housing, Other whoever asking. asked, she's, she has told me this numerous times, that you have to have an affordable housing component. How, will you, how is this gonna help the regional problem of affordable housing? So it's consistent with what I've heard from Metro. It just struck them as very odd, some of the strikeouts. Well, that's interesting because that conversation may change how I just perceived that last hour and a half work session. Mm -hmm. Which is fine. Yeah. I'm just I'm just telling you the conversation I had in full transparency as mm -hmm. as Councillor Kuiper said. So so this is this is a big decision how you handle this and what language, if any, you strike out. So um, at the risk of um, going into debate, I will ask this in the form of a question. Um, is there, I mean, is there evidence that if, that in, given our community, its size, its, its proximity to mass transit and those types of things, that by, you know, by uh, creating more land and building it out, we can solve that affordable housing issue as Metro defines it? I guess what I would say is that we want to provide opportunities. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we are solving it. And we're providing opportunities to solve it. I also think that the term affordable can is, is such a loosey-goosey term, attainable housing. One, what is attainable to someone may not be attainable to someone else. So there's the, the whole issue of affordability doesn't mean all Section 8 housing, but it could be that my son, who's going to graduate with a master's degree in engineering in three years, may not be able to live in Sherwood, um, even if he's coming out of the docket making 60 k a year. So <clears throat> I think it's just something to think about what does affordable housing really mean, and quite frankly, what does it really look like? Because we have the whole missing middle housing that we of just now starting to reach out to our community to discuss about. Which is really what that next phase in the process is gonna be all about, is what does what does this really mean and what do we really do about it? Yeah. So, so a question then, um, how does Metro define that in terms of determining compliance? And, and to Joe's you know, point about if we take that language out, they're not gonna approve it because we're not serious about affordable housing. How are they defining it? Well, the Metro will not be acknowledging the housing needs analysis. It is DLCD. Not that DLCD will be taking, but not advice, but comment from Metro in their decision. And DLC didn't state that if the language is taken out, they would not acknowledge it, but they also stated they would be they have concerns about us and are providing our range of housing options at all income levels, and that's part of the statewide planning goal. So it's a little vague, so they don't really have an answer for you. Um, but in the end, it's DLCD that will acknowledge this document. Well, in their letter, they just state in the second paragraph, second sentence, the Oregon administrative rules specifically require housing be provided commensurate with the financial capabilities of present and future residents of all income levels. It's kind of a wide, yeah. big and I, I think, umbrella, but. And I, I think where I struggle is the future element because just because of the dynamics of our community over time. So I, I'd like to add another question. I was awake during the slide presentation, I promise. But <laughs> can, you, can you please boil down why the Planning Commission struck out the text in as few words as possible? Why did they do that? That's the only part of the meeting I didn't watch. So, <laughs> so I'll try. And, um, I, I think that they felt that there was, it was subjective. Um, that they felt that it was making conclusions that hadn't been vetted and that there was different um, interpretations of whether or not that was true or not. And um, were concerned about that becoming something in the document that, that then was going to um, tie the hands of people going through the policy discussion. And, and do you think it's going to tie anybody's hands? Um, 
I do not believe it will tie hands because, and again, I think it's important to have this conversation. And if we were just to adopt it and, and say this was perfect, then it might, because we'd be like, well, this is clearly what we all wanted and we all knew exactly what this was. But we're having this conversation. Right. The Planning Commission had this conversation. Um, I think it's, it's understood both at the staff level, the council level, and, and the Planning Commission is hearing the conversation that we understand that there might be right. a little bit of um, discussion still to be had that we can then, um, as we adopt the policy element, tweak things a little bit. I mean, is that... But we're having that conversation with this current council, this current staff, and this current planning commission. But it's also on the record. Um, but let's be realistic. People are going to go straight to the housing needs and analysis. They're not going to go watch the video in three years. Yeah. <laughs> well, they might look at them. I can tell you, I mean, and I'm not promising that staff necessarily does this all the time, but it is not uncommon for us to look back and go, and what were, what they, were they thinking? thinking? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, no, and right. I know and you've done that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's kind of like Sherwood West. I mean, that was just a preliminary concept plan. It wasn't a comprehensive plan. It was a guideline, and it's going to be changed. So that's kind of what I feel this is. I feel like this is a standard report by that organization. It's not unwarranted, some of the findings in there. Maybe we don't agree with the v vernacular that's used by whoever wrote it, but it doesn't necessarily, if it's not going to tie our hands, then maybe, you know, as long as we, we, we take it into consider all aspects into consideration that can tailor our, our thoughts. And, and Carrie was giving me a look like, mm, I wasn't totally right in what I said. I mean, I don't think it's going to totally tire. Do you want to comment? No, the thing is when we have the comprehensive plan update, there's no reason why we have to use the same housing needs analysis. I mean, do we want to fund another one? Do we want to take a different time period? I mean, it all it's all time and money to it, but we aren't tying our hands with this with the comprehensive plan update. We can change it. We can get a new one. There's options. Am I out of line at the a point of order? We're still in a public hearing, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we're supposed to be asking questions, and that is what we're doing. Yeah. Oh, okay. It sounded like we were still giving comments, so I was just curious. Are we finished with our questions from staff? I'm sorry? Did you have any Okay. Uh, Council's questions are finished. We now open the public hearing. Mayor and Council, I do have um, two submissions. Our first is Kara Rep. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Great. So, uh, Kara Rep, 21985 Southwest 107th Avenue in Tualatin. We just moved two weeks ago, so I'm no longer a Sherwood resident. Um, but I have just some questions and concerns related to the housing needs analysis. Um, a couple of my questions were, um, what was the concern presented today, which I think you kind of went over. The concern to me, just to clarify, sounds like that we would not, we could basically throw our letter in the garbage if we adopt the edited version of the housing needs analysis. That's basically what that concern sounded like to me, so maybe just confirmation of that. Um, also, I was curious, what's our year-over-year -year growth from the 90s to current? Um, because I think there's a lot of averaging going on, but there have been a lot of cycles happening. Um, and I'm curious, in our cycle, where are we and how does that impact our potential ask? Um, I was also a little bit concerned, and I know we're trying to keep the housing needs analysis separate from the urban growth boundary ask. Um, but if we're being honest, one is, I mean, just based off of a single comment, they're clearly going hand in hand right now. So um, our letter is asking for 455 buildable acres, which is 4,050 um, more units. Um, I think so. It came out that we need at least 50% of that to be 
high density housing, right? So if we're going to be doing that, that would be about 230 acres at 19 units an acre, um, which would be an increase in population based off of the average household size of about 12,500, which is a 64% growth for us. And I think I'm just concerned about the impact that would have on the city. Are we prepared? Do we have the funding to be able to support that kind of growth in a responsible way? So I think I don't really have any strong statements. I'm not 100% opposed, but I am leaning in that direction. I have some real concerns about kind of the data that was presented. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. The next uh, person, uh, Justin Kai. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, Justin Kai, 22118 Southwest Friars Lane. I would just like to um, start with uh, just, just, Kara didn't um, say that prior to her moving, she was uh, serving as one of our planning commissioners, which <laughs> we're. Uh, happy to have her with us and, and set for her to go. Um, likewise, I'm currently also continue to serve as uh, one of your esteemed planning commissioners and um, love doing doing so. <laughs> um, so initially I, I didn't intend to have any comments um, at this initial hearing. I just more wanted to kind of hear what was presented, but then also to hear what your thoughts were on, on the issue. So if there's any questions or um, anything you'd like to ask of me, I'd be happy to, to answer any of those. Um, overall, from the presentation and report, um, I'd just like to clarify a few things. Um, in, and, and this is speaking from my understanding of what we did as planning commission and not to be taken as me speaking as for the planning commission as a whole or anything um, as such. Um, I feel that what we did as the planning commission in terms of removing language or content within the housing needs analysis was really based on removing what we viewed as what was essentially conjecture. And it was content that we really felt was more opinion and 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 not not purely factual information, which is what we were trying to really bring the document document to, because that's where we felt it was, or at least that's where, what I feel the document really should be, is purely fact-based information and not trying to drive towards a certain outcome or, or agenda. Um, my, my primary concern with the housing needs analysis, and when, when I look at these issues, I tend to try to look at them from a perspective of hoping for the best, but planning for the worst. And what, in, in my reading between the lines on the housing needs analysis, my concern was what its recommendations potentially stood to, how, in terms of how it would impact or potentially change the core characteristics of what makes Sherwood Sherwood. And for myself as a planning commissioner, anything that stood to impact that is not something that I'm in, in, in support of. <clears throat> it's my understanding because of the UGB ask, the housing needs analysis was moved up in terms of when it would essentially be done. We're, it, it's, and as I've come to understand how this has, has moved forward, I really see it as this is putting multiple carts before the horse. And that horse is the comprehensive plan update, which really has has only had one meeting and really hasn't even truly begun. But all of this and this other information and decisions potentially stand to have drastic impact on our community that, that are permanent and long lasting and essentially stand to nullify what the, the comprehensive plan update is trying to do, which is really trying to plan out, you know, how we as our residents would want 
our community to move forward. And the most important part of that is the public engagement community input portion of the comprehensive plan update, which hasn't, uh, hasn't happened yet um, in regards to these important issues of housing needs analysis and uh, urban growth boundary. Your public time has expired. Please wrap up in the next 15. Okay. Um, the housing needs analysis recommendation recommended a 50% single family housing, 10% attached single family housing, and 40% multifamily housing, which really doesn't address the missing middle that many people continually talk about um, being needed in Sherwood. And really the, the most, the biggest issue of the housing needs analysis is that it, it kind of lays out a formula of if you follow these things, you will attain affordability. And I think we should all really know and recognize that that's not a guarantee. However, these things stand to make drastic impact and changes to Sherwood, all for the sake of affordability, which I, I would be skeptical that would materialize. So in essence, I, I truly believe, you know, a lot of this is being pushed for what are essentially inconsequential consequences, things that we're concerned about, but I kind of look at them and go, well, if that happens, I, I think that's not the worst thing. Your, your time, your time is up. Please Thank return you, to your seat. With no further testimony, the hearing is now closed. Council discussion. And just as a reminder, this is the first reading. We're not going to um, have a decision until the April um, 17th meeting, but it would be great if um, council could give staff some general direction um, if there are changes that are requested so that um, a ordinance brought back reflects what you might like to see. So I have a point of clarification. The housing needs analysis is data that's used to inform the comprehensive plan. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Just wanted to clarify that. Then the other item, it's interesting because some of us have talked about this and I think it's, it is related. I just don't know how it would be incorporated or um, edited in some way to, to recognize it. And that is uh, form based codes as opposed to talking about density or talking about capacity um, in ter instead of density because when you see densities, medium, you know, MDRH and LDRH, all of these things, they, they always have a number component to them. And after some conversations that I've had with Councillor Dirksen, he's, he's also, Metro's also moving to sort of discussing more capacity related rather than density. And so can that be a way that we can still talk about some of the things that we, um, uh, the data, <laughs> Right, present the data, but present it more in terms of capacity or form-based codes uh, some way rather than density. To me, goal 10, as it's currently written, um, have to the answer that. is no. As we move forward with the comprehensive plan, the city can say, hey, we want to do a form-based code. And this will inform the form-based code process. Um, we could end up with a completely different looking code if we want. That's, that's okay. all up to Sherwood. Comments? I, I, you know, I, I would just say I, I know that you know Metro has been trying for years to solve the affordability problem, and uh, uh, I share some of Justin's concerns that you know unintended consequences. Right? We're trying to solve this problem, or we're you know because they're they're gonna Metro is gonna have. Uh, definitely some influence on in what the zoning looks like, you know, on any ask that we do out there and even zoning within the city here. So I think that that's something we need to take seriously because, um, you know, they've they've tried to solve affordability in apartments by, or, you know, by creating, going vertical and creating more apartments and our rates can continue to rise. I think you could add 600 acres out here and create and put, make it all single family detached homes and our home prices will still go up. Um, I think that's something important for us to consider as we're, as we're working through this and, you know, do we want to push back on Metro a little bit or do, or do we want to just be compliant, you know, and, and try to, you know, 
weave through their process, you know, to get an ask through. Just, I'm just throwing it out there for well, discussion. Well, are we talking are about you, the housing needs analysis? Yeah, yeah we are. Right. I, am. I just want to say it, one thing, though. It, it, and it's not necessarily com being compliant, but what it is is strategy. Do we, do we take out what's stricken out and then thus remove one of our options, which is potentially option A, working with the with the school district that may or may not pan out. I don't know. We haven't had that conversation. But certainly taking this out will remove that option. So keeping language in potentially is a strategy that we could use to keep our options open. I just want to put that on the table for discussion. So. Do you have any other questions? Um, I, well, I guess is there general support for taking the planning commission recommendation out head nods head shakes can i can i ask a quick question before that how much time and energy did the planning commission i mean we've had an hour here um i, how believe, much, that, I believe that was the four hour meeting yeah we talked about that <laughs> yeah and, two how, hours how much, i listened to it today that section yeah. is almost two hours Quite a bit. Did they have a work session on it too? Or um, it... They did not have a work okay. session. And, and frankly, um, in, in staff's mind, and I, I get that we are not always correct, but in staff's mind, this is truly a technical document and we, we see it for what it is. So it, it really, um, we, we, didn't, we didn't do a work session because we didn't think it, it required a work session. In hindsight, it should have had a work session. We should have had the consultant come in and talk to the planning commission. Um, but we didn't, um, and we went to a hearing, we continued it, we got them some more information, um, and they would have loved to have more time to work through it, but we really didn't have the time. And I'll also say, um, ideally, this would all be done at the same time through the comp plan update, and it is frustrating. Um, as Carrie said, I think we found out in August, when did we find out that Metro essentially um, massively changed the goalpost as far as what was going to be required for this ask and we found out that we needed to have an acknowledged housing needs analysis which really required us to expedite this process um, in order to be we didn't want to um, not proceed and forego the option for council and so that that's that's the situation we're in and um, that we there was not as much um, discussion um, with the consultants as we would have loved to have had with the Planning Commission um, but that is that is what it is and at the Planning Commission level we did not get feedback from Metro or um, DLCD to share with the Planning Commission I don't know if that would have changed their recommendations or not but you have that and you get to make a decision not tonight but um, <laughs> So I think I'm probably the only one up here that is comfortable with the initial report. No, oh, I, 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 I agree. Uh, okay. I'm comfortable with the report as presented by the, house, the, the original housing needs analysis and see it as an informational document. Um, so for my two cents is stick with that as staff. But And my two cents go with your two cents. Maybe six cents. I was going to say... I totally understand the Planning Commission's comments. Absolutely. And, yep. and I find that this report has a lot of subjectivity and a lot of opinions in it, but I also find that it's a report that we are to use to, to help inform us, but we're not tied to this. We're not saying we will have this much high density residential. We will have it. It's just saying this is what this consultant thinks we may need to address our housing shortage how we obtain how we obtain that is going to be a conversation that we're going to continue through the comprehensive plan. And, right. and I will add on to that what Councilor Young said. And this is this document is Eco Northwest does a lot of these documents, and what we're paying for actually is a professional opinion. Anybody can do a data dump, but paying someone for a professional opinion who's got the experience in uh, presents this report as a matter of course just makes sense to me. That's the world I live in. So, um, you know, and I, while I can understand some of the comments from Planning Commission, I get that. Um, certain things could say, you know, some qualifying statements, but. So I imagine yeah. when this report was requested, part of that request was obviously give us the data, but also give us recommendations and an executive summary. I mean, that's what comes into this report. So I, I think, you know, and I sat in those, those Planning Commission meetings and I, I saw how hard they worked and it, there's some tremendous questions that were asked and, and 
a lot of back and forth on that. And I, I agree, a lot of this is very subjective, but that's kind of what we paid for in this report was to get a professional opinion. opinion. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I don't think anybody's going to dispute the data that's in here or the numbers that are out there. What we take from this, I think, is where we move forward. But I will say, although we some have seen lots of reports from this company or whatever, that I appreciate the Planning Commission diving into it because I don't think we should just be rubber stamping what comes out in front of us. Right. So right. I think that's why we ask questions and that's why you guys help us. <laughs> so then I think I am hearing a, a general um, consensus, um, not consensus, that's not accurate, a general direction. I know. <laughs> um, that we will bring forward to the April 17th second reading the ordinance as um, with the housing needs analysis as originally presented um, for your consideration. Yes. I don't need to make a motion. No, we'll no. Okay. Moving on, city manager report. Mayor and Council, I'll be brief. Just a couple reminders. You still have an urban renewal agency meeting after yeah, you close the council meeting. Yes. And then you also have an executive session um, after that. So you still have a number of items tonight Party. on the agenda. So in light of that, the only thing I want to remind everybody, because um, I've gotten questions about, so we just finished up another election. Um, when does Mayor-elect Mays um, and the two councilors that were elected take office? So. Um, Sylvia Murphy, our city recorder, has reached out, as she always does, with our partners at the county elections office and has gotten a pretty solid confirmation that we should get the results from the county by the end of March. So April 3rd is your next meeting, so we are scheduling um, uh, to have the item to accept those results or certify those results on your agenda. Um, and then after that is all done, um, uh, we can swear in Mayor Mays, or soon to be Mayor Mays, and the two councilors. And our current mayor will pass the gavel on to the new mayor. And the good news about that is we will not have any more special elections in 2018. <laughs> um, none of you can resign early, please. Okay. <laughs> Assuming no one, no scandals, no, no one leaves town or decides to resign. Um, we will have a election in November, as we've said all along, the mayor seat, um, which is a two-year term, will be up in November, and then three council seats, including the two that um, Councillor Rosner and Councillor Griffin have just been elected to, will be up along with Councillor Kuyper's seat. So we will have elections in November, but between now and November, we should be pretty solid without any special elections. So I just wanted to make sure everyone knew that. Good. Thank you. Uh, council announcements. I know we have another meeting, so I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, I Believe it or not, I haven't had a school board meeting since the last time I was up here, so I have nothing to report there. Um, school board's actually meeting tomorrow night, um, and I'm unfortunately going to miss that, but uh, Councillor Young has agreed to uh, step in for me. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, but a couple quick updates. Uh, I was at the uh, Main Street meeting um, at the Rebecca Lodge on March 15th. And just a couple things from that meeting. Uh, they, they're having an early day engine show, May 5th. It'll be outside of the uh, Cultural Arts Center. Um, I encourage people to go see that. My dad was a huge um, old steam engine, old engine enthusiast. He used to go work the sawmill down at Brooks. If you've never did that at Brooks, that's another interesting thing to see. But it's amazing the amount of effort people back in the um, early 1900s put into putting an engine out there, putting a belt on it, hooking it to a washing machine, starting it up just to wash some clothes. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I think awesome. I would have just washed them by hand, but, um, <laughs> but it is interesting to see those guys out there and they love to talk and talk about their engines and stuff. So I encourage people to go see that. that oh, and here's the flyer. <laughs> What, what date is that? Second Saturday in May. Yeah, okay. May 5th. So um, that's a good one to go to. Uh, and um, I think I'm going to close it out with that. All right. I attended the library advisory meeting before the last council meeting. And I just wanted to give some accolades to our library manager, Adrian. 
the meeting opened with an opportunity to share. So everybody on the advisory committee shared a little bit. And the aha moment came at the end of all that and the fact that one of our most treasured pieces in this community is a library and it's, it is the most accepting and the most diverse mm -hmm. in this community. Because no matter what we said as a group, as advisory members, it all came back to the library being the convener. So I thought that was just really a really neat opportunity. She does have her wonderful newsletter that's out with all the cool things that are going on in the library. Uh, the annual report is out. I just wanted to share a couple of statistics on that. There are 49,000 items in our library. But when you look at the countywide library system, there's 1.7 million items that we can choose from. Mm -hmm. And then I thought it was interesting, the value, the monthly value calculation, somebody who uses the library saves roughly $588,000 a year by mm -hmm. using the library. I thought that was pretty cool. National Library Week is April 8th to the 14th. I'm also a liaison to the Senior Center. We have our next meeting, Friends of the Senior Center, on Thursday at 1.30. I'm really looking forward to that. But in the meantime, I, I went and I visited it and talked to some of the seniors, visited with the woodcrafters and the knitters and the crocheters, the Butterfly Boutique, and they're very, very proud of their center. And then I met with Bob Silverforb, and he has lots of ideas that he would like to see uh, with the friends of the of the senior center so i'm really looking forward to those opportunities the chamber world uh, there's a new map that's out a very tasteful map it's really well put together so if you want one i encourage you to go to the chamber office the next breakfast meeting is april 10th and we're going on a field trip it'll be at tri-county gun club so please attend at 7 15. and then what <laughs> And then Cruise in Sherwood, the annual tradition is coming up June 9th. If they need volunteers, please, please sign up or you can register your cars, whatever you want to do. So I'm going to skip that announcement and that announcement. Um, Rotary tree sales coming up April 21st through May 12th. Come get your trees. They're $13 a tree unless you buy three or more and you can get them for 10 bucks. And it funds the committee, the service committee for the Sherwood Rotary, Rotary Club. And then an opportunity for your kids, July 9th through the 13th, is Peace Village. So it's a summer camp style, teaching conflict resolution and um, being basically uh, how to get along well with, with others. And then my last announcement for tonight is that the Sherwood Police Foundation event, the annual stakeout Boots and Bling, is May 19th. So please mark that your calendar. Tickets will go on sale on April 2nd. Just a, two announcements. Um, I am the Cultural Arts Commission liaison, and we met on Monday, and before that we met a week earlier to evaluate some requests for proposals, um, responses, to help us start a public art master plan. And we interviewed two great candidates and chose Mr. Bill Flood, who's done a lot of work at the city of Hillsborough with their public art master plan. He's gonna be amazing. Um, we're really excited about it. We have a, the Cultural Arts Commission has a sort of esprit de corps. They've got a great group of people that work together. Um, I just find all the boards and commissions have great people on them. So what, <laughs> I mean, everyone that I've been a part of, it's been wonderful. So that's happening, you'll hear more about that. It's gonna be a really, really amazing uh, thing to happen, to have that public arts master plan. And then I'm also li the liaison to the Tualatin River, uh, Friends of the Tualatin River National Wildlife Refuge, and we had a Saturday meeting that lasted all day and talk about a powerful group of people with incredible knowledge about everything from botany to wetlands planning, all of these people, some of them are retired, some of them are not, but we did a great planning session um, and there's gonna be some really cool things happening out at the refuge, so. And one of the things that they have, which I need to get part of the old engine show, they have a wonderful engine that sorts onions. And of course, historically, it was, uh, onions were grown in Sherwood, and they have this incredible machine that sorts onions. So I'm gonna see if they can go to the old engine show. Thanks. Go ahead.
All right. Um, so I am the uh, liaison to the Planning Commission. Uh, we have not met since our last meeting, I don't recall, but I do want to call out that there are three spots um, available on the Planning Commissioner up for um, applications. We have two commissioners who are currently on the Planning Commission. Uh, their seats are open, and then Kara Rep, who was here, unfortunately, uh, moved out of uh, Sherwood just recently, so her spot is open. So applications are on March 26th. Um, there's a lot of talk on Facebook and everywhere else about all the things that are going on in the city. Why does that happen? Why does the city put a hotel next to a traffic circle? Um, planning commissioners are very important to the city. Um, we need good qualified people to come and apply for being on a planning commission to help guide the future, UGB. Um, comprehensive plan, all the things that we've been talking about tonight, the last you know several weeks, planning commission are the, are the people that make that happen. So March 26, application to do, please, if you're interested, um, do apply for that. Um, community traffic safety class um, is going to be being put on by the police department on Tuesday, March 27th. It is, um, the speaker is going to be a professor from the University of Portland, and I apologize to the doctor, I am not going to attempt to pronounce his name, um, but it is a class, you know, a lot of talk around um, Sherwood recently about pedestrian traffic safety. So um, this class that's gonna happen Tuesday, March 27th, between seven and 8.30 at the police department is designed for persons throughout Oregon with responsibilities related to traffic and highway safety. So it's gonna be really kind of geared towards more city personnel, um, traffic personnel, um, sorry, police uh, and law enforcement personnel, but there's gonna be some very uh, interesting uh, information that's gonna be shared in that. So I'll be attending that as well, and I hope some of the people who have interest in uh, community traffic safety will attend that as well. Um, and just also to note that the Sherwood Center for the Arts uh, Gala this year is on April 7th, and I believe they still have some tickets left, but they I know they're, yes, they are going fast. And this year's theme is a murder mystery theme, which looks awesome. I think many of us attended last year, uh, and it was a big top circus theme, and they went over the top with performers, decorations. <laughs> this year, I, I, knowing Maggie, it, it's going to be even better. And, and the friends of the Sherwood Center for the Arts, it's gonna be fantastic. So um, I'm guessing the tickets are on their website. I don't know exactly how to get those, but I think many of us are gonna be attending this year as well. So um, please help the Sherwood Center for the Arts by attending. And that's all I have. Okay. All right, last week, I'm the um, uh, liaison for the Police Advisory Board. And last week was their meeting. And one of the notable things from that meeting was um, Captain Hanlon did a presentation or a discussion on the active shooter response. And he just kind of, the, the board had asked him, you know, what do we do in an active shooter situation? And he just went through some basics because I don't really think, you know, I don't want to know everything our, our police to tell us all their plan. But just kind of went through some basics and, and really... I think it's hard to plan for an unknown scenario anyways. So I think that um, they give, he gave some good information. It's on video if anybody wants to go see what uh, he presented. And the other thing I just wanted to acknowledge, because we get faithfully every month in our packet, a staff report from the field house from Lance Gilgan. <laughs> and this month I was just looking at it. And he, year to date, um, for between this year and last year, we're up $10,000 year to date. So our rentals, our league fees, our everything he's doing in there, some reason we're selling all kinds of snacks. <laughs> Those have quadrupled. But I just thank you, Lance, for giving us that yeah. update because yeah. we don't see you, but we see your report. Go ahead. I just have three things. Uh, the Sherwood Robin Hood Festival uh, Association meeting happened last week, and they're looking, again, for volunteers. If anybody's interested in participating, it's always a ton of fun. And then all kinds of volunteers. And they think they had like 20,000 people at the parade the last two years. So it takes, they need volunteers for the parade. They need volunteers, you know, for Saturday, the village. They're going to have some great medieval night jousting and fighting with fairly safe swords, I assume, uh, in the park. It'll be really, really cool again this year. Um, let's see. The next parks board meeting is April 2nd. Is that right? Next month or a week from, uh, and it's seven in this room. It's always a lot of fun. Come check it out. And uh, uh, Hello Dolly is going to be the summer musical. We just cast last week. We have a great cast. 
Uh, and uh, that'll be the last weekend of June, first day or two of July before Music on the Green hits the next Wednesday. Uh, two things. I think Maggie Chapin did it the dinner next week or in two weeks at the dinner theater. It's going to be her, you know, because she's leaving town, so she's going to be oh, guilty. And I think, uh, I think the bunny should apply for a spot on the planning commission. I think <laughs> liven up those meetings. I've been there. We need a bunny. That's it. I've just got a couple of items. One is... The date that we mentioned uh, a little bit earlier for the Old Engine Show, it's actually the first Saturday in May, and that is that is the 5th. Okay. Uh, the second thing is I want to say a big thank you to this council for the deep, active, and meaningful involvement with all of our boards, committees, commissions, etc. There are like 70 people involved in all of those things. And these folks are doing an outstanding job of uh, connecting, representing the council, bringing things back, and uh, we are blessed with uh, their work. And I sure want to thank you all. And with that, we're adjourned. Next.